to what was developments happening in Germany at the time, including where, where many people, many disciplines of Wilhelm Renke sought to make history into a more objective science, including Karl Sudhoff, who, the, who founded the Karl Sudhoff Institute for Geschichte der Medizin, and which is this institute for the history of medicine as a rigorous research field in Leipzig. And when, when Welch founded the department that I am now chair of, he sought to hire someone who really knew how to do history of medicine as a research field. And this is uh, Henry Sigarist um, to, to take this position I now occupy. And what I want to point out here is that there's this development here of, of this specialized research field of history of medicine that, that doing historical research can inform the structures of medical care. Sigarist in Baltimore, I was just a short train ride, ride away from Washington, D.C., became deeply involved in health policy, sort of part of an informal cabinet of health policy, and was, was, was a time, his cover was, in the, he was faced on the cover of Time as a Time Man of the Year, and was able to apply history of medicine as a way of understanding problems in the social world. And by the 1960s, perhaps, this field hits its high watermark in Anglo-American medicine. And many medical schools have full-time faculty. There are required courses, if not departments. Um, and yet, uh, by 1966, uh, one historian of medicine, Lester King, speaking at a conference on the role of history in medical education, focused on what he saw as this fundamental problem, which is that, quote, we cannot seriously maintain that it makes better doctors in any practical sense. So the trouble is insisting that the humanities make better physicians then takes us into this world of metrics, right? So if you believe, if you make the argument that humanities are just essential to being a humane physician, well, that's a fairly intrinsic argument. But if you make the statement that I can empirically demonstrate that humanistic training makes better physicians, then there's sort of a show me the statistics. And it's very hard to actually find those statistics. And some would argue it's a classic divide within the medical humanities that even trying to demonstrate empirically using some sort of metric that humanities makes a better physician is to, is to play a loser's game. That once you jump into that pool, you're already at a detriment because the kinds of things that humanities do are so hard to measure that you're more likely to come up with some sort of null finding or perhaps even some indication that humanities make worse physicians. And so why even get there? Now, I want to point out this development of the broader field of medical humanities. I started with history, and history of medicine departments were found all over North America. But a series of crises of medical professionalism in the 1960s and 70s helped to focus attention on the limits of histories that were taught largely by physicians as a way of addressing the social context of medical ethics or other um, challenges in the social context of medical delivery. And new forms of medical humanities, especially medical ethics, um, which required the skills of philosophers and other scholars outside of the profession of medicine take rise in this time period. And we can chart a few places. You know, Pennsylvania State University begins to plan a new medical school in 1964, and its founding dean envisions a curriculum that takes the philosophical, spiritual, and ethical aspects of medicine as seriously as the biomedical sciences. And the second medical humanities program opens in University of Texas at Galveston in 1973 with a goal of encouraging the intellectual and professional growth, cultivation of sound judgment, and enlargement of character, virtues, and skills indispensable to good doctoring. Now this is, you know, this is 50 years ago. So one way of saying that these initiatives that we have now in medical humanities are nothing new. And historians can often be accused of walking into a room which people are doing exciting things and then saying, you know, this thing that you think of is new is really not so new. And, and oftentimes we're not involved, invited to parties, you know, as, as a result. And so the, the point I want to make is that that's, that's not enough. That the fact that medical humanities has existed for a long time doesn't invalidate the efforts and the energy happening right now in investing in human, medical humanities. And I want to come back to this towards the end, which is what is it about the early 21st century, the moment that we're in right now, that gives a particular urgency and excitement to medical humanities work here and elsewhere? Now, as the field grows, though, it is frequently derided by other faculty in medicine as being kind of a touchy-feely area, a kind of a gravy or a garnish to the main course of preclinical education. Um, in a preface to a 1995 special issue of Academic Medicine dedicated to the medical humanities, uh, a pair of authors reject the idea that humanities are soft and fuzzy. And instead, they saw the humanities as a set of field, quote, concerned with the most difficult areas of human life, the areas of personal experience through which we live and understand our lives, 
Each field, ethics, history, law, literature, philosophy, or religion, also offered its own methodological and theoretical contributions. So literature helped students explore the human condition and all its singularity and mystery. Religious studies could enhance the student's ability to practice genuinely person-centered medicine. History of medicine provided a much needed context in which to appreciate medicine's constant values. This is in 1995, this pushback of saying, well, you know, the humanities are not touchy-feely. It's not just spending a day at the art museum or reading a Chekhov short story and feeling like you're more human. There's actually a serious meat. There should be such a thing as a hard medical humanities, which is challenging and rigorous and has real impact and bite. But by the time a second special issue on medical humanities appears in 2003, even more obstacles to this vision had taken shape. Individual schools, individual medical schools, struggled to really set up a broad-based field of medical humanities, often because faculty in any given school you know, only had ex expertise in certain areas. So uh, New York University and Northwestern, for example, were both strong in literature, but had little engagement with history. The University of California, San Francisco, and Harvard, both were strong in history and anthropology, but didn't really have a strong basis in in, uh, his, in literature or religious studies in their medical humanities programs. And relationships with bioethics could be contentious. Sometimes bioethics wanted to be part of medical humanities. Sometimes it wanted to be a separate field in its own right. And amid these kinds of struggles by the early 20th century, 21st century, you see advocates for medical humanities begin to focus on what kind of contribution can be made by any field. So it doesn't matter who is at your institution, Anybody should be able to do these few things. And the important thing was to have someone doing some form of humanities, regardless of method, content, or mode of analysis. Um, so a few of these ideas, and you could probably guess, well, what are some of the things all humanities have in common when you're thinking about their role in medicine? Well, any of them can help students explore the experience of illness, um, suffering, and healing, help health professionals become more self-aware or self-critical practitioners. Um, an initiative called the PRIME Initiative, which stood for the Program to Rebalance and Integrate Medical Education, um, sought to include patient-centered skills and critical thinking, and then articulate what they called the shared vision of how such education promotes professionalism. Um, another common feature is promoted by uh, Arno uh, Kumagai and D Delise Ware, which involved what they called making strange, that any of these different humanities fields could help um, disrupt what people's assumptions of the everyday world was and help get in someone else's shoes and imagine what it's like to be on the other side of a clinic bed or desk. But th the point I want to make here is that by teaching these kinds of qualities of here are things that any humanistic field can do, um, th that any humanities fields are fungible, it really helped make medical humanities curriculum more accessible both to accrediting bodies like the American Association of Medical Colleges and also to medical schools which would have variable faculties in different fields. And they could say, well, I understand that we all need to have someone teaching anatomy, but what are the key aspects of medical humanities that anyone teaching medical humanities needs to do? And, you know, th and in this framework, it didn't matter if a given school had an artist, a novelist, or a historian, because the essential contribution was something that could be provided by any of them. But I guess what I, what I want to argue today is that, that this framework came with its own constraints, that it paradoxically constrains the claims for the value of medical humanities and education by relegating them to the most generic tasks, things like cultivation of professionalism, empathy, or estrangement, which I think are very valid goals. But reduce the possible things that any humanistic field can actually give to a learner. And, um, you know, we, we, uh, we, we, I'd like to make this argument a little further by talking about history. And although it's certainly the case that um, education and history can foster professionalism and humanism or strange making, it can do a lot more. And David Jones and I have argued elsewhere that um, history of medicine should be considered an essential domain of medical knowledge. That there's contributions that history can give to medical education that are just as essential as really as anatomy or as biochemistry or microbiology. And we're making this case for history, um, but I think you could make a similar case for literature. I think you could make a similar case for visual studies. I think you could make a similar case for literary analysis. And the point that I'm trying to make here is not that every person who wants to be a medical professional needs to go through all of them, but by actually getting down to the nuts and bolts of what kinds of things a given method in medical humanities can actually 
a given humanistic technique can provide to someone who is training in the field of medicine, you actually can actually elaborate much more potential of these fields in this space. Um, so here is a list that we compiled. We, we actually uh, gathered a group of historians that were working in health science campuses um, and boiled down to a list of like 13 things that history did for, for medical education. And then from there, because 13 is just too long for anyone to remember, we reduced it even further to five levels, right? And just to go through them really quickly, because I'm prepared to give this talk to a dean of medical education at the drop of a hat, right? You know, that, that in order to be effective, all physicians need to be able to do these five things. We need to understand that there's a dynamic nature of disease over the course of a lifetime of practice, that therapeutics are a continuously evolving landscape, that health inequalities persist over time, that the healthcare environment is continuously in flux and not rationally designed at any one moment in time, and that the dilemmas of medical ethics or medical research only make sense in a historical context. Now, to elaborate for a second, disease changes over time. This may be obvious to all of you already. Oftentimes, people think of this in terms of epistemology, that what we understand disease to be changes over time. So what does it mean as this early 19th century uh, caricature by uh, George Cruikshank describes to think of ague and fever. And so you see here ague, and this is a disease category we don't really use so much anymore. Ague is this kind of white spindly ghostly thing that's lacing these pincer-like fingers into joints. And you can relate to this, those, you know, if you, any of you have had a flu, those moments when all of your joints just hurt so much. And here's, here's fever behind it ready to envelop the patient in some sort of you know, painful and uncomfortable and probably scratchy bear hug of warmth. Um, now, what this doesn't immediately speak to the 21st century view of is that fever was considered a disease in the early 19th century. We would think of fever now as a symptom or a sign of disease, but fever itself was a disease. And so how to understand the process by which something can actually be a disease and then not be a disease anymore and shift over time. A, a more coherent example, perhaps, are that these changes in the understanding of disease can be quite civic, significant even within one's own lifetime as a practitioner. So certainly by the time I began my education, the sense of ulcer, peptic ulcer disease as being highly related to questions of stress and lifestyle and oftentimes psychogenic factors was a dominant model. Um, the Nobel Prize was awarded to a group of researchers who demonstrated that the majority of cases of ulcer were connected to a bacteria, H. pylori, as many of you know. And this is a substantial shift in understanding not only of the way you think of a disease, but how you address it. And it really upended what many people had learned in medical school. Many existing practitioners had learned exactly the opposite and had to adjust to a new world in which the same old disease was treatable by antibiotics. But it's not just our understanding of disease that changes over time. It's also the underlying epidemiology of disease. This is a piece that we wrote for the 200th anniversary of the New England Journal of Medicine, looking at the causes of death and the shift over the course of the 200 years that the New England Journal of Medicine had been in publication. And you know, you can, you can sort of pick out different lines, like I bet you someone in this room could try and figure out what this spike is right here. What, what disease curve do you think this is? Yes, that's influenza. Exactly, and here you have the influenza pandemic. And then we could look at other rising curves over the 20th century, and you could guess that we're talking about chronic diseases like heart disease, um, cancer, declining functions being other infectious diseases. And you realize here that actually over the course of a treatment, the healthcare system that you train to actually go to work in, that you may no longer address the diseases of the present that you're practicing in. And this is, I would call this an, an ontological understanding or an epidemiological understanding of how disease changes over time. It's not just our understanding. It's actually the stuff, the work of medicine itself changes. So I've lingered a bit long on this to say that I actually think in order to be a, an effective physician, you need to be able to understand the dynamic quality of disease over time. And that's actually historical thinking. So I, I'm not going to linger as long on the others. I think that you can imagine the extrapolations of how therapeutic practices change dramatically. I think visually I, en enough said, perhaps. Um, so, you know, thinking about inequalities of health that, you know, this entire field of, of health disparities research, which is so urgent and important in the 21st century, is, is meaningless without an understanding of the historical structures that give rise to such discrepancies, especially along lines of race, ethnicity, 
gender, geography, um, understanding why there is a 20-year life expectancy discrepancy between the neighborhood that I live in in the city of Baltimore and the neighborhood that I work in in the city of Baltimore, it really cannot be understood without thinking about the history of race in the American city in the 20th century. Um, likewise, understanding our healthcare system, here's the hospital that I practice in when it was founded, and here is a wing of it that was built and completed most recently. And these buildings reflect very different understandings of what the built institution of healthcare should be that are inflected with the different moments in which they're created. That being said, it's not like everyone practices medicine in one of these glass rooms now. I mean, those rooms are still part of the hospital. So think about the hospital as a metaphor in which there's pieces that keep on getting added and others that get repurposed over time. For example, at, at the Mass General Hospital, the um, the solaria that were originally built as terraces for tuberculosis patients to have their lungs recover from the, the dread disease by being out in the open air. Um, during my period as a medical student, they were converted to, can any of you guess? Hmm? Not an art gallery, maybe that's what they do now. Yeah, now it is, yeah. So at the time they were smoking lounges. And so there's this, the great irony of how these spaces that are created for one thing they're therapeutic, get created to and diverted to another. But I think metaphorically speaking, that's how our healthcare system works. Like it was not all built at one time. Things that are built for one thing get converted to something else. And unless we can think historically about it, we, we really can't solve the problems. And finally, to think about dilemmas of health practice and policy, here is an example from a colleague, uh, John Warner, uh, who's a, is a chair of the section of history of medicine at Yale. Um, and he, he published a, a fascinating and disturbing book of postcards or not quite postcards, really kind of form, of form of calling cards that medical students would create at the time of themselves posing. And so here's the medical student lying on the bed surrounded by the cadavers that he and his classmates had been dissecting. And this was normative at the time. It was understood to be a way of processing the experience of being a first or second year medical student and going through anatomy class. But if, if anyone at Johns Hopkins did this in 2018, I mean, they, they would they would be kicked out immediately. I mean, this is, this is not a kind of a behavior that would be tolerated right now. And it's not just because people were coarser or cruder in the mid-19th century than they, than they are today. It's, it speaks to very, the importance of the cultural context in which ethical norms and practices take shape. So again, I lingered on that perhaps a bit longer, but you know, here are five very different reasons about contributions history can make to medical education, just in terms of being a competent practitioner. And I could extrapolate values that historical thinking has that's specific, uh, thinking about uh, the development over time of contingency and context. Um, but uh, you know, I could also point to arguments along these lines that were made quite a while ago. So here's Eugene Cordell writing at Hopkins in 1909 about the value of history in medical education. And you know, a lot of this still rings true today. It, it teaches how to investigate. It, it's, a, it's an antidote against egotism and error and despondency. It increases knowledge, gratifies natural and laudable curiosity. Um, Cordell's also interested in sort of history as a place to find inspiration in heroic figures. And I don't want to linger on these, but um, I, I, I think that, that these arguments that I'm making specifically for history as a humanity that has distinct application to medical training in very practical senses, I think could be made for pretty much any field in what is constituted as the medical humanities. Um, so for example, if we were talking about the visual arts, and I could point to the work of my colleague and actually my residency director at the Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston, Joel Katz, who himself trained as an artist before becoming an infectious disease specialist and a professor of medicine and the leader of this fine medical residency training program at Harvard. I mean, now, Joel has very concrete recommendations for how visual thinking can, can, treat, can, can teach principles that are actually essential for people to become good physicians. For example, thinking visually, learning aspects of art history, but also learning aspects of just thinking about visual arts in general, can teach pattern recognition, gestalt thinking, and nonverbal aspects of diagnosis that happen on a regular basis in clinics every day in the country. Um, it can teach understanding pre-verbal forms of character attribution and bias so that what kinds of attributes you read into certain kinds of depictions of people in, in images helps us to understand why it is that we perpetuate certain forms of disparities in care practice in emergency departments. For example, why it is that we have empirical knowledge that people walking into an emergency department 
who have clear and evident fractures in their long bones that are visible across the room in an x-ray on a humerus or on a femur will be given different amounts of pain medicine, if pain medicine at all, based on whether they are perceived as black or white, based on which they're, whether they're perceived as Latino or non. And that much of this thinking happens on a visual sorting level in a, in a way that clinicians who clearly think of themselves as not biased and not racist nonetheless participate in. So Joel would argue these are essential aspects that doctors need to learn and they come from thinking, they come from the visual arts. Narrative medicine, can talk, we can talk about the importance of attending to patient perspective, of experiential basis that's always present in medicine about the therapeutic basis of being able to build a narrative of one's illness and recovery, about building communication skills and history taking. Um, in creative writing, uh, we can think of substantial reading and reflective essays. There is a whole field of improvisation medicine in which claims can be made about team building, about how one actually, you know, no healthcare practitioner in the 21st century really works alone, but some work more or less effectively in interprofessional teams. Um, there's an entire field of graphic medicine having to do with exploring effective health communication through visual representation. And many of these forms make specific claims to helping to train medical students. Or if applied at a pre-medical level, level it's helping to inculcate a more humanistic approach to medicine before students become doctors. Um, and you know, this is very different though, right? What we're talking about in terms of narrative medicine is very different from say pursuing a PhD in comparative literature that focuses on say, diagnosis of disease. And I want to highlight this because so far all the claims I've been making, they're very instrumental claims about what medical humanities do for medical trainees. And I've been focusing on physicians in training, but I think we could say equivalent things about nurses in training, about pharmacists and other healthcare workers. But again, if you think about what it means to pursue a PhD in comp lit, you get very different things come out of it. Now, I'll give you an example. So here is Lakshmi Krishnan, who is a postdoc and general medicine fellow that I have the privilege of working with at Johns Hopkins. She um, is a practicing physician who has a PhD in literature from Oxford. And her work is fascinating work. It talks about what she calls the co-production of clinical problem solving, right? And we're used to these clinical problem solving. A lot of them are published in the New York Times. And you have a case, you want to figure out what's going on. It's a mystery. It develops over time. Clinical problem solving, on the one hand, is a genre. And detective stories at, at the same time as a genre. And we all know detective stories. And her point is that both of these things, they're, they're forms of writing, and they emerge at the same time as formal modes of writing, really the late 19th and early 20th century. And they borrow from each other. They co-produce one another so that, you know, the mystery narrative can't be a mystery narrative without Sherlock Holmes actually being a physician, that the medical metaphors come all the time. And similarly, when you look at people writing about clinical problem solving, there's always the doctor the, or the diagnostician as a detective. And so Lakshmi has done fascinating work, which has really improved my understanding, for example, of what diagnosis is in ways I hadn't understood how relevant literary analysis was to thinking about diagnosis. But that's very different from her doing a creative reflection essay as a medical student. I mean, she pursued a PhD and did very innovative research. In medical anthropology, for example, I could point to the work of Sarah Roth, who's a PhD student in the Department of Anthropology at Johns Hopkins School of Arts and Sciences. Her work focuses on the changing experience of precision medicine and redefining the experience of diseases like breast cancer. And Sarah is particularly interested in what happens when breast cancer is diagnosed before the fact genetically, um, when, when there's a convergence of experience between people who are genetically at risk for cancer, who now undergo surgery, chemo, radiation, and then regular follow-up imaging and that their experience is now increasingly indistinguishable from people who have cancer, even though on some level they've never had cancer, they've just been at risk for cancer. And Sarah took the lead in assembling a fall graduate student conference at our center on diagnosis and social context. What is the work that diagnosis does in people's social worlds? And we could also talk about what it means to have a PhD in medical sociology, um, focusing, for example, on uh, the role of racial categories in forming international health policy and vice versa. And this is the work of, this is the featured work of uh, Sasha White, who's a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Sociology in Johns Hopkins. And his research focuses on the role of race in the production of structures of international health and vice versa, asking how certain bodies become racialized and the racial characteristics are essential to how international health policies, which are seen to be scientific and objective, nonetheless have substantial discriminatory effects on different populations. Um, and Sasha took, is taking a leading role in organizing a conference that our Center for Medical Humanities is launching in the spring 
on containment in public health. And so when we contain diseased bodies, whether it's on an isolation ward in a hospital or an entire nation that can be cordoned off, and we, the recent Ebola epidemic is a good case to think with, um, what, what, what social work is being done? And I, I want to linger for a moment on this field of medical sociology, because many of you here might say, wait, hold on a second. That's, that, that's not a medical humanity. That's a social science. And I want to point out that medical sociology is useful for us to think about in terms of a principle I, I would call symmetry, which I think is very important for medical humanities. That, that one can talk about medical humanities being an application of the social science to the medical world, or of the application of how thinking strategically about the the health of the body and illness can do different things, open up doors for humanistic fields. And I think sociology helps to illustrate these principles. I'll give one quick example, where medical sociology is not just a boutique subfield of sociology or an applied field, but a key trading zone between these two sites. And I, I, some of you may know this figure, uh, Talcott Parsons, arguably the founder of academic discipline of sociology in North America. And Parsons helped to develop a concept known as role theory. It's one way of understanding social context. It looks at the different roles that an individual might take in a different day. Like I might wake up and be busy being just a tired person and then become a father. I have to get my kids off to school and then I'm a patron at the local coffee house and then I'm a teacher but then maybe I'm a student. And that you're different in these different contexts. And Parsons' book, The Social System, took as its central case the doctor-patient relationship as a way of understanding what it means when someone takes on what Parsons calls the sick role that when someone becomes a patient, they take on a different form of social relations, and that that's key to understanding the social work of, of medicine. And I want to linger on this, because the sick role is a very useful concept in medical worlds, but the sick role was also a very useful concept in establishing the field of sociology in academia in the 20th century. And my, my, my own vision for medical humanities would be a space in which actually both of these things happen. That, that we see an interchange where this intersight of medical humanities potentiates both directions. Um, we could say similar things for the work of the sociologist Irving Goffman, um, but I, I won't linger on, on Goffman. We can come back to that later. I want to conclude just by saying that these can easily seem like different worlds. Um, humanities are instruments for training better doctors versus medical fields as subjects for producing better research in humanities and allied social science fields. Now, in forming our center at Johns Hopkins, we wanted to do both. So we started with the scholarly side. We started with researchers, particularly researchers in training. And the three individuals whose images I've just shown you come from different fields. They're based in different schools at Hopkins. And yet they've come together to actually form part of this collaboration, which we want to see as a dynamic collaboration, a two or maybe even three-way collaboration, and branch out into other applied forms of medical humanities. And also bring faculty together to create um, opportunities for, for trainees as well, and then to produce events that might impact the broader publics. And um, we put together an advisory board to try and represent the different kinds of fields and constituencies that we thought medical humanities should touch upon. Uh, we also, at the same time, were involved in these conversations about building, as one part of this, this medical humanities major, that we wanted to be in conversation with, with undergraduate opportunities. Um, and then to create spaces for fellows across the different schools to come together. Um, I, you know, I, I won't linger so much about what it means to do things across different professional schools in conversation with the college, because I think the interest here is more in what do you do as a college, what, is, what do you do for undergraduates. But I do want to say that as we put together an idea of a medical humanities program for undergraduates, the faculty who are working together may come up with unusual conversations they haven't had before, which can also lead to different research. And I also think that research that students actually activate in this process can help create new linkages as well. I think any of you who are undergraduates here, by the time you get to your final year, are capable of doing innovative, cutting-edge research. And you might see at these intersections of courses you've taken between different faculties something that you can put together that, that neither of the individual faculty members are doing on their own. I think, depending on your interests as students, we've listened consistently to what our students wanted. And our, our students, in this last year, were really interested in thinking about how does scholarship engage with with activism? What's, what's the relationship between scholarship and advocacy in the field of health? And so one of the first public events we put together was an event on health medicine and civil unrest. And this was last spring, and many of you know, last spring was the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. and ensuing substantial urban unrest in Baltimore and many other cities in the country. It was also just a few years after the 
the death and police custody of Freddie Gray in Baltimore and urban unrest following that. And there are different ways of drawing a line between health and urban unrest. Many of you will remember that in the aftermath of Freddie Gray's death, um, many claim well, that Freddie Gray um, had lead poisoning, that one can actually look at different elements of the social disparities in the city of Baltimore that were written into the body of Freddie Gray, both in his life and in his death. And you draw an arrow between social forms and of, of, uh, of civil unrest and actually health outcomes. Um, whereas others su suggested that if you actually look at what happened after the 1988 civil unrest in Baltimore, you saw the establishment of a more robust primary health care network. The community health center that I practice at, East Baltimore Medical Center, was actually found directly as a response to the recognition after 1968 that black communities in East Baltimore were almost totally unserved by uh, the, the, the hospital Johns Hopkins that I, that I work at. And so this was created as an outreach between the East Baltimore and activist community East Baltimore and Johns Hopkins. So here you can draw in a different way that, that civil unrest can actually lead to different ways of addressing health disparities. So we had this conference. We involved many people from the East Baltimore community, different artists and, and authors as well. And the part of the goal here is how, and, and I, I mention this here because I think you have potential here for this at Providence College. How can you imagine a form of medical humanities that rather than merely existing in those burnished wood rooms that we saw before to help physicians in rel relatively elite schools feel that they are more complete people, right? How can you, in which case humanities themselves can be kind of tarred with a sort of elitist trapping, right? How can you form a form of public humanities that by actually in investigating the role of medicine in the social world can help potentiate action that helps to produce a fairer and more just world in terms of health equity and health outcomes. So, you know, I, we, we've, our strength has been our people. I'm a director of this program really only in name. The endeavor only makes sense as a collective. Um, I point out that Carolyn Suffren, who is really my partner in this endeavor and, and organizing it, who is like me a physician and social scientist slash humanist. She has a PhD in anthropology and is a practicing OBGYN. Um, and we've just been lucky to have, when we put a beacon out, find just a remarkable group of scholars and trainees come out from different parts of the university. Charlie Weiner, who I think you may have seen his face on earlier posters for this event, who Charlie became the head of the undergraduate concentration in medicine, science, and humanities. But really, we just have, we found that there were more people and more people, and we're still building. And some of these people I knew before, many of them I never would have met if I hadn't been involved in building the center. And this is the slide I want to conclude with. Um, I, I think that where you are now in terms of imagining the potential of what medical humanities can build and unlock based on the strengths you already have here at Providence College is, um, is something which I think can help bring together connections and conversations between people who you can't even know right now that you're not talking to yet. And so we certainly found this in our experience at Johns Hopkins. And it's something that I wish for you as well. So thanks. This has been the most gratifying part. I admire your efforts here today. And I look forward to discussing your plans and your ideas of what this field can mean as well, individually and together. So thanks again. Me to bring the mic if it. And if there's no student question, I'm happy to open things up to faculty. All yours, Matthew. Okay, okay, sorry. Uh, so thank you. Uh, that was um, very interesting.
It was a lot. Boy, I, my digestion powers were uh, hard at work, uh, as hard as they've been today. Uh, but thank you for that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I, I hope not inadequately, try to sum up one of the one of the threads of your argument, what I think was one of the threads of your argument, and maybe this will be of service, maybe it won't, <laughs> depending on how well I do, and you can correct me. So my name is Matthew Cutterbeck. I teach in the philosophy department here at, at PC. And um, and I it really, I found this really interesting, this history that you went through, um, so many things that were fascinating. For example, the difference between going back to old knowledge and then the emphasis on new knowledge, that in itself is just such a worthy topic, and so I really thank you for bringing that to the fore. And as I understand what you said, I, th I think you were saying that in the early 60s, medical humanities, as you've described it, described it might have needed to start justifying itself. It's either not, this has nothing to do with being a better physician, so how do we begin to justify ourselves? Well, we turn to something like, I think you mentioned, uh, ethics. Uh, ethics departments may begin to take rise there in the 60s. And I, I, I selected a phrase in which you said um, the emphasis there might be on virtues indispensable to good doctoring. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a really interesting phrase, which I, I'm going to come back to. I'm going to try to make this as brief as I can. But this review is going to help me make, uh, invite you to understand what I'm going to be asking. So the, the, the story since the 60s, it sounds like, has been a, one in which we need to defend the, the medic, medical humanities. And I see you, as I've understand your presentation, to be part of that defense. You're saying, well, it's still very applicable today for those five reasons that you went through at the end. Of the, but the defense took on different forms. In the 60s, it took on a certain form, had a certain vocabulary. In the 90s, um, you said a little bit there that there was an emphasis on something, for example, called person-centered medicine, which is another phrase I latched onto and found really interesting and evocative. evocative. And then when you talked about what more recent defenses have looked like, the vocabulary changed again to critical self-awareness on the part of practitioners, some patient-centeredness, uh, cultivate professionalism, empathy, strange-making, humanism, disrupt certain narratives. So the, the changing vocabulary of the defense. And then your the vocabulary of your defense, these five points, which is really interesting, which you went through at the end, that was, that's your version of this sort of long 50-plus year defense. Now, is that okay so far, what I've said? Uh, yeah, yeah, although I would also say that in, in what I'm arguing is, is claims that are specific to one field, which is history. Okay. Right? And as opposed to the claims that are general across all fields. Okay. But yes, totally. Continuity, but also change the continuity in the sense that there's always these arguments about why medical humanities, yeah. but change in the grounds, and also perhaps the sense of whether it's proactive or defensive. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess what, you know, I'm, I'm listening with the ears of a philosopher and not of a historian. So when I think of what the, and, and I'd be interested, here's where my question begins to formulate. Um, so when I think of what the humanities uh, has to contribute to medicine, I... <clears throat> certainly wouldn't want to exclude what you've said here in these five points, but to, to my ear, it sounds quite minimal. Uh, if I think of what the humanities would have to, so <laughs> here's what I inadequately think of when I think of illness and doctoring and disease. I certainly think of a person-centered approach. I like that a great deal. Uh, I also think a little bit with, um, and I'm, I'm curious if you would know his work, Edmund Pellegrino, uh, the, um, who uh, sort of approaches it from the fact that disease, the experience of disease is an experience of a kind of existential, uh, an attack on my existence in a much broader sense than an attack on my bodily health, but I feel somehow challenged at my deepest core. Um, so when I, would, when I think of what the humanities would contribute to medicine, it would be some kind of tradition where we talk about uh, not just the body but the soul. So if I'm thinking, if I'm working in the tradition of Socrates and you know the, what, what was his legacy to the Western tradition? Well, it was, it was a vocabulary, a conversation about the soul and its destiny. And so I would think that. Um, Again, when I hear, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit of a devil's advocate here. When mm, I hear sure. your, when I hear your five points, I think, well, sure, but how much does that help the doctor? I, I, I don't care if the doctor at my bedside knows those things, so much. I don't think I do. Maybe I should. 
What I, do, I would argue you should, but we'll come back. Okay, well, good. Do argue that I should. Uh, I'd like to hear that. But what I do care is, do, is, does he, is he able to exercise um, an awareness of the larger spiritual context in which this all takes place? Is he able to address my spiritual needs, which is really one of, would be one of my main uh, experiences as a person who's ill? Um, uh, does he have a sense that there is such a thing as a soul? I think, I think that's a normative question that makes all the difference in the world between a good doctor and a not good doctor. Uh, not as able to heal my body, but as good at doctoring. Uh, is that person aware that there is, a, does he know there's such a thing as a soul, he or she? And is he able to bring that into the picture of healing me? So the, the picture of what the humanities would contribute, I, would, I want a lot more, a whole lot more. Sure. And so I, and I'm wondering what you might say to my desire for a whole lot more. Yeah, I, I think you should. Want more. I, I think, but just to be to be specific, right? I actually think that these the claims that part of a fundamental basis of what medical humanity should do is acknowledge the existential challenge that disease poses to the patient and the variability in that challenge, right? Also, that there is something which is a really well recognized problem in you know, whether you're studying narrative medicine or medical sociology, in what happens as biomedical biomedicine develops in power over the 20th century is that it has less space to actually talk about and acknowledge these existential dimensions and that there's less training that is devoted to these devices, right? That, that these are real problems that the medical humanities are actually brought in to solve. Even with Osler and Welsh in the beginning of the 20th century, it's these sorts of problems that they become fearful that medicine will become a field of mechanical technicians that just train and attend to just the material basis of the body and miss the art of medicine, which involves in actually hearing, listening, understanding the plight and crisis that your patient is going through. I would say the reason that those aren't part of the five that I listed is I think those actually are, some, are things that should be universal across the medical humanities. And in that part of the talk, what I was trying to emphasize is that to only focus on the universal aspects is to miss some of the specific things that different fields bring in. But I wouldn't say it, that, that those five, even though I'm a historian, I wouldn't say, well, the five things that history does for the 13 you know, are the only important things in the medical humanities. It's that I actually think we need to attend to both. To, asserting the commonality of the common good that medical humanities do, and I think everything you just listed would fall under that, while at the same time attending to the different, the unique things that different humanistic fields can bring only through attention to that one field, right? So that we don't lose the particular character and strength and methodologies of a given humanistic discipline when we advocate for an interdiscipline like medical humanities. We don't want to gray it all out. But that common denominator is still important. I just don't want it to be reduced to that. I'd also add here that the questions of the soul are so interesting because, again, you do have this, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll use the words of uh, Arthur Kleinman, a medical anthropologist who has, I think, recently in his career become very interested in advocating for a strong basis of a grounded and robust medical humanities, right? Um, but Kleinman, you know, let me wrote a very influential critique of biomedicine, and one of the lines that he used as an anthropologist is that if you look at all the different healing systems in the world today, right, biomedicine is the only one that has no room for the soul, right? And this is part of the value, Kleinman argues, of taking a ethnographic or a comparativist approach at even a moment in time in different ways of understanding healing the body is to understand what biomedicine lacks. So, Part of his emphasis on what anthropology offers is to attend to that lack and think about as a, as a physician, do you want to be part of the lack or do you want to be someone who actually helps to fill it in? Um, and I think you know, historians can do that in more of a, not at the same time way, but a comparison over time. Like how do we understand the loss of these spaces in healthcare practices and what, what takes their place? But so I, I, I'll witness what you're saying and suggest that yes, that I think that is actually part of what all medical humanities should do. And that don't, don't see the five that I've listed as not having room for that, but as a way of also not forgetting the specific characters that different disciplines bring with them. We could, we could list philosophy among them as well. Um, I see a hand up over there. Um, hi, I'm Peyton Brown, and I just had a question. You, um, 
So what I was getting the most out of this was just how um, the study of humanities in combination with in the medical field kind of promotes empathy. Um, saying, I was just wondering, like, what's the best way to implement this? Because I feel like there needs to be a division between empathy and doctors and how they treat their patients with the ways that they kind of have to do it more objectively, if that makes sense. Well, actually, explain a little more. I'd love to hear you talk more. Okay, about so that. I just mean, like, I feel like one of the, some of the best doctors are ones that are kind of able to keep their personal lives out of the lives of their patient because in combination it gets kind of messy. So I was wondering, but I feel like um, incorporating humanities into their medical studies would kind of contradict that. So I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, that's a very perceptive question. And it's something that I wasn't able to kind of put my finger on that question until I was sort of like almost done with medical school and realized that something had been, had been kind of bugging me and starting to think historically about it. Um, which is to say, certainly when I entered my first year of medical school, there's a way of teaching how to use your, your body and your, you know, your, your ability to talk as a diagnostic instrument and as a place of care in which it's very important to be inoffensive, right? In other words, to, to create the word that we often use as a clinical demeanor, right, which sometimes means cold and unfeeling, also has these other glosses of meaning, well, to create a professional demeanor in which anyone could feel comfortable telling you their story and feeling like they are not being judged. And there's a risk of putting yourself into this place. Um, too much of yourself out there can actually uh, signal to certain patients that they're not, that they're not welcome or that you are, you are going to judge them. And there's all kinds of ways in which there's very well documented, um, especially in the, um, in the gay, bisexual, uh, lesbian, transgender community of um, when the clinic is actually a space in which one feels welcome and equal and treated, and one of the clinic is a place in which one feels instantly judged. And the difference that that actually makes in care and even in, in outcomes, right? So we were taught to detach ourselves, right? Um, and even to see something like a joke as, as a really dangerous thing, because if you tell a joke, it might go the wrong way. Um, although I have to say that after learning that, I, I, I took a a fabulous course on the history of the doctor-patient relationship with a, a professor, a Chris Krenner, who's now at Kansas. And he had us reading the work of Michael Ballant, and who was actually involved in teaching the same courses, but like 50 years earlier. And, um, and Ballant was writing about how the, the actual physician can never take themselves out of the interaction. And they just need to recognize the part of themselves that's in the interaction and try and be careful about that. And the more that I've been practicing, the more I realize that that, that perspective is missing now from current medical education. And I, it's interesting, I, I've gradually, as I've been in practice longer, I've started using jokes more and finding that actually it often works really well. And that a lot of the patients that I work with really want me to put a part of myself. And I, I, I'm imputing that on them. And maybe if we had them here, they'd say, uh-uh, you know, like, I don't know where he got that from. But I, I actually think that they do. And that process of actually, and, and there, there are many strains within the medical humanities of, of how to use things like, like, like where does things like improv comedy actually help people become better clinicians, which works in the opposite direction. So you're pointing out that dichotomy, and it's, it's a very interesting place. And I think the common goal, which is a very important common goal, is that it is really important as medical professionals to create a place in which everyone is welcome, in which one's own presentation and biases, right, do not exclude, right? And yet, I don't think that in order to do that, one needs to strip all personality, and I think it's a mistake to do that. And I think that's how medical education is currently structured. So I don't have the answer to it, but I've, I've actually thought a lot about it at, over, at, in different ways over different parts of my own training, and I would love to see more work done in that area. Thanks for that. Yeah. I, um, my question was similar. Um, Dr. Cutterback brought up uh, the soul and how um, you know, a doctor may be appealing and thinking about the soul on a human level and the human condition. Do you think like, there should be a line um, where doctors don't, uh, don't think about maybe trying to reach the human soul and maybe stay on like, um, I know the scientific level will also bring in medical humanities, um, just maybe because if a doctor's trying to think about the soul, maybe it's distracting them from their scientific goal uh, as physicians. Sure, that's a great question and one that you, know, you could write books about. Um, so <laughs> I think this idea of where the boundary is between the spiritual and the scientific in medicine is fascinating. I would recommend a book to you by the uh, Canadian historian of medicine, Jacqueline Duffin, who spent years working in the archives of the Vatican 
on the role of physicians in certifying whether something was or was not a miracle. And, and some of you may know this already, but that you know by the by the twentieth century, um, actually declaring miracles for the beatification of saints um, increasingly involved the scientific expertise of physicians, many of whom, of course, were also spiritual believers in their own right. And so in this book, she writes fascinating ways about this. This is one example of that interface, right, in which to talk about one requires the other, but it gets really complicated. Um, but the other side of that, I would say, is that um, I do think that it is possible for one attend, to attend to the existential challenges of an individual without having to actually impute which form of spirituality they have, right? But just acknowledging that we all share existential challenges. Um, and at the same time, it's very possible, and I would say very important for healthcare practitioners to understand that for a given patient, their own spiritual the spiritual significance of disease and healing can be a quite like a, a dominant and very important aspect of both the nature of their suffering and the nature of the context in which they actually recover and get better. So I've learned a lot of this by working with the hospital chaplains. And um, you know, good hospital chaplains have such a they have such a challenging job of trying to not assume that they understand the spiritual world that the person they're working with is in but at the same time, understanding that it may be incredibly important to them, and actually in most cases probably is, and trying to figure out how to work at that interface. How do you not make too many assumptions and yet underscore and validate and provide what is needed? So that's another, like, again, I, not that you're all looking for research projects, but you, you know, like that, that's a book. <laughs> so, but yeah, is there another question over there? Yes. We, we have time for probably one more question. Uh, and before the question, let me just remind you all that there's a reception right afterwards, just down the hallway in the great room. Please feel free to come and continue the conversation there. Uh, Dr. Green will be with us for another little while at that. And thank you all so much for coming. Okay, Kathy. Hi, Dr. Green. Thanks so much for your uh, your presentation. I found it fascinating. So I'm going to continue with the spiritual theme for a minute. Um, and you answered this question um, in your talk, but I'm going to just um, explore it a little bit more. Um, so for a number of years, I worked across town with medical students at Brown. And um, I was always um, um, delighted and by and proud of the fact that the students who came into the medical school there, who were PC graduates, had this um, this very distinct um, affinity for or facility with addressing spiritual issues in general. You know, there was just this level of comfort that I didn't observe routinely in other students. And I know it was, it's anecdotal. Um, but you know, when you when you address the issue of whether or not you can quantify whether an appreciation for the humanities makes you a better physician or not, and you said it's that's very difficult to 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 show, is that true across the continuum? In other words, for those in the basic sciences, those in their clinical years, those in practice, is there no uh, no way to sort of um, um, explore or or um, quantify whether that that um, expertise or, or comfort with the humanities makes an appreciable difference in the, in the uh, care of patients? Yeah. So, okay, that, that's, a, that's a good question. And there are ways. And many, many people are trying and occasionally find findings, right? And I, I don't mean to suggest that there's no way to produce a positive finding that demonstrates how attention to medical humanities can actually produce physicians who are, you know, less likely to burn out, right? more likely to find joy in their profession, uh, have greater patient satisfaction, help their patients feel listened to. Like there are, there are ways in which this is, you know, this data is constantly being produced. There's different metrics on Likert scales. With this. There's, a, there's a burnout scale. There's, you know, so there are ways of measuring it and actually even putting it into numbers as well. I guess the point I want to make is, well, what happens when you don't show a finding? Does that mean that it's not worthwhile? And that's where the argument that it's a loser's game to even enter comes in, right? Because I think that there are arguments, for example, you know, is that one of the classic evidence-based medicine problems is, you know, do you need a clinical trial showing that jumping out of an airplane without a parachute is a dangerous thing to do? Well, no, right? 
and partly you know that's a bad idea. And partly that actually, if were you to do a trial, it would get findings very quickly, so it's not a great analogy. But there are many arguments that, you know, one could argue, could you have not, do we have firm knowledge that um, dissecting a cadaver actually produces a, a better doctor, right? And, and we don't, right? And the, the use of anatomy in medical education is not based on a requirement for evidence that it's worthwhile, right? It's something that has been so built into the clinical curriculum, understanding that, you know, part of medicine involves knowing where the parts of the body are, right? And so I think you could make that argument on a fundamental level, as, as many have. I think, I think Matt, Matt and others have made this, that, you know, medicine is not a biological science, right? Medicine is a really complex practice which involves interactions with human beings who are at fraught and dangerous and vulnerable moments in their life and are exposing their body to strangers based on a, a relationship of trust that is complicated by the power in this institution and the complexity and vastness and incomprehensibility of the healthcare system. And that's such a tangle, right? And so having a sense of an understanding of humanistic and social worlds, humanities and social sciences, I just think it's so essential that one shouldn't have to actually get into the business of having metrics such that if a null finding comes, that means it's invalidated, right? It's not quite the parachute, but so that, that's, that's fleshing out that dilemma. I do think there's a way of answering that question that relates to your question earlier too, which is about empathy, where I thought you were going initially, which is, well, we want to train empathic physicians, and many physicians are not very empathic, right? As some of you know through personal experience, and one of the questions we have is, well, is trying to make interventions to be, build empathy by the time people show up in their first year of medical school, is, or do, do they work or is it already too late at that point? And so some of the questions we get into which have to do with these interventions earlier of what it means to think about a medical humanities program on an undergraduate level is that I think if someone can't demonstrate a capacity for human empathy by the time they enter medical school, they, they really have no business being in medical school. But the structures that we have that decide who does and who doesn't get into medical school don't necessarily orient as strongly towards that right now as how they do on tests like the MCAT. And I think that there are things that can be done, and there are many parties who, would, who are working to try and help change that. But it's another way of getting at the same question. If it's a fundamental value proposition of what we understand the field to be, then the evidentiary basis is less important. Thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon. Please join me in thanking our guest. All right, thank you very much.